Welcome to A Preacher and His Work. With me today is John King. John works with the Disaster Response Team. John, good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about Disaster Response Team and, and what it is that you all do. Well, we, we go in and uh, support the local church uh, that's been affected by disaster as they support their community. We uh, bring in volunteers, we bring in support staff, we, we help try to clean up and rebuild those who have been affected. And uh, the hope is that with that we can, like I said, support that church as they go forth and support their community. So, so you all, as you do disaster work, you're very church-based in what you're doing? Yeah, we, we try to find a, a local congregation that, that we call a host church, and we ask them if they want to be the host church, which sometimes they don't know what that means, but <laughs> most of the time they're, they're down for it, and they, they do. And you know, we, we use that as kind of a base of operation. Uh, all of our volunteers that come in, they, they typically will stay there. Uh, we set up kind of dorm rooms in the, in the classrooms, and you know, we, if they have a kitchen, we use our kitchen to help feed those staff, and then that's kind of that hub, and we kind of come out of there. And our, you know, that the, the local church has been there and will be there for long before and long after we're gone. So what we hope is that local church will be that, that beacon of light to the community um, that it should be. So, Fantastic. Now, <clears throat> disaster, disaster response team, this is uh, under an eldership? We are under the eldership of the Castle Hills Church um, in Ohio. And uh, been, we've been doing work since uh, 2004. And uh, so we've seen uh, quite a bit of stuff as we've gone through and um, continue to go forth. So uh, having been through some disaster response situations before, I mean, you get there, putting people in classrooms, that sounds like a good idea, but how do you shower? How do you, the, the cooking, the, the laundry, how do you all handle all that? Well, it, it's with time we've built it, like you said, some systems, but we have some, some trailers that we bring in. We have a shower trailer that uh, basically we can work off grid. We don't have to have power. We run it off a generator and a gas, and so people can come in and shower with that. We have a kitchen trailer, 30-foot kitchen trailer that I've never seen it that working that busy, but we can put out two to 3,000 hot meals a day out of that trailer, and it's off grid as well. And so worst case scenario, if there's nothing available, we can still come in and do some work. Wow, and that's, that's <clears throat> when it's really needed the most. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. When a, when a disaster happens, I know a lot of times Christians uh, have, have great intentions, great desires, uh, and, and want to help. Uh, what's, what can they do? What's the best thing to do when disaster strikes? Well, it depends on, on what they want to do. If they want to come actually physically help, we'll be glad to help give them that opportunity. You know, volunteering, coming on site, it doesn't take you know, hours, uh, days, months. Whatever time you've got, you can give it to us and we'll take it. Um, a lot of people come in on a weekend and we'll spend a weekend working and then they'll go back to their normal life and then if they can come again, we'll see them again. Um, so, you know, there's, with that, um, the other thing is, you know, checking with us and seeing what we need. Um, you know, we've, a lot of times there's a lot of things out there that, that people don't need. I mean, um, there was, an estimate of about 60% of what's sent to disasters are not needed. So so what's actually needed, does that vary from disaster to disaster? Sure. I mean, it did, you know, floods versus hurricanes versus fire, uh, tornadoes, you can just imagine that it's going to be different. So, you know, it's just kind of from one case to another. We typically send in a standard package of tools and equipment that we send in. And then from there, we will try to bring in more uh, as we figure out exactly what people are needing. Okay, okay. Uh, is there anything that you can say, oh, this is something that we always need in a situation? Um, well, finances are something we always need. <laughs> um, but the, the typical thing that we, that we do when we get there is we send, out, send people out to go work. So you can just imagine anything that goes into doing with that you know, we, we have a, a semi full of tools that we send in. And so we send those tools in and we, so we have all that equipment. And like I said, we also do some back end stuff. We, we supply some clothing and, and some needed stuff that maybe people don't have. And uh, so we, we work with those situations as we go in. But 
I couldn't tell you yet, you know, every day we need this, but, you know, those kind of vary as okay. we go along. Okay. But a, a dollar is something you can always use. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that what's interesting is when you, when you go into a disaster, news media, and everybody knows about it. So the first few weeks, there's a lot of outpouring of love and a lot of support that's come out. But after those first few weeks, when media moves on to the next big thing, um, people just tend to forget about what's going on. So, you know, as an example for Harvey, we spent seven months on the ground. Um, you know, we're, our motto is kind of first in, last out. And so we want to be there as soon as we can and stay as long as we can. But as you know that those, when people forget about things, support loses, volunteers quit coming, money starts uh, dwindling away, and there are many times there's there's work and many times no money to finish the job, so. Oh, yeah, I know uh, uh, back when we caught up with the disaster response folks down after Harvey, mm -hmm. uh, this was just a couple weeks after the hurricane, and just about everybody else had pulled out. Right. And. You know, that was beginning two weeks into a seven-month right. trek. So that's uh, quite, a, quite a long-term commitment. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people that come and go. Some are government entities, some are locals, some are, you know, like we are, that, you know, church-based uh, organizations, and everybody's wanting to help. But, you know, that's kind of the reason we want to come in behind the church because, like I said, they'll be there, and we, mm -hmm. want, we want to give them that support you know, as, as long as we can. And one, one question that always comes up when we look at, at uh, a big effort, it takes a lot of money, does it really do any good? Oh, yeah. The, there's, I mean, we, we support the local church and we want to push that, but we're trying to build relationships. And that's from those relationships, we hope that we can, can build the kingdom. And ultimately, that's where we're, what our ultimate goal is, is we just want to spread the gospel. And, you know, people's hearts are open um, more in this situation. They have a need. We can build that need and help that need. And then with that, we build that relationship. You know, there's, there's many baptisms that come from it. There's Bible studies ongoing right now. Um, I know of, personally know of four baptisms that happened from Harvey directly from our people, not, not us, but our volunteers and their relationships. And mm -hmm. uh, so one that I know of is a gentleman who, uh, lived in Rockport, and they started working with him. And he lived on the on the bay, and they took him down to the bay and baptized him. And you know, he's he's been uh, working with the Rockport Church of Christ, so they're continuing that relationship as it as it continues. So so starting to see the wisdom of having that connection with the local congregation. So as as you're working evangelistic efforts, they've got that home already built into the system. Right, and that. You know, we try to get them to come to the building as much as possible. Um, you know, when we're giving out donations, we, we try to make the church that hub of donations. That way, they're already comfortable. There's, there's the building, and there's the people. So, you know, we try to push that relationship as much as we can. Yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds like a great plan. So, John, what's your background? Um, I have been a paramedic all my life, um, worked through system there, and then uh, just before we came on with, uh, with DRT, I was emergency services manager for a large construction company, basically running a clinic and uh, the emergency services for that company. So, Okay. Uh, and you're an elder in the church? Yeah, North Bay Church of Christ. I'm the elder there. And that's actually how we, we started with DRT is they called us and said, do you want to be a host church? <laughs> and so started there and we were working with them and I popped off to Mark Cremines, who's the, the founder, and, and I said, man, it would be awesome to do this full time. And his statement was, be careful, because God's listening. <laughs> you know, and now here we are. So, oh, yeah. And uh, how, how do you find the work? <laughs> as far as the disasters, we're always watching. You know, we, we tend to stay within the continental U.S. We just we do that better. We've done some overseas responses, but it's harder for us to do an impact better there. We just do a good job here. So mm -hmm. we, we watch what's going on and we don't have a criteria that says, um, at this point we'll go in. Um, you know, if a church calls us and says, hey, we need help, we will do everything we can to give them some assistance. You know, you know example, we've got Hawaii going on right now, the, the volcano is going on. We're watching that. We, it's not inside the continental U.S., but if, if there was a need, 
that we could fill, we'd definitely look at, at trying to fill that. So I, I can just imagine the logistics involved with that. That would be pretty difficult to try to get our equipment and personnel. We're volunteer run, you know, as far as you know, Harvey, we had nearly 2,000 volunteers come in. It would be hard to get those 2,000 volunteers to Hawaii. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's probably some things we could do. It just wouldn't be the same impact that we normally would. Mm -hmm. What type of disasters have you all covered in the last several years? Well, since 2004, there's been, I think the number's 36 disasters, um, 17 states and 38 different cities that we've covered. And generally, you know, you think about hurricanes. Well, if you live on the coast, you definitely think about <laughs> hurricanes. But hurricanes are one of them, fires, floods, um, and um, tornadoes. Those are kind of your top four. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends on, you know, it, most of the time we think about natural disasters. But, you know, I, if there was a, God forbid, a, a bombing or something of that nature that, that we felt like we could help, we'd definitely go in and do that as well. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, if uh, something were to happen uh, and, and people, you know, touches their heart, they want to get involved, and uh, you know, one of the first things that happens is people go in their closet, things they don't wear, they pull them out, throw them in a bag, and say, here, here's some clothes to give away. Yeah, definitely. Um, is that a good thing to do? Typically, it's not a good thing, um, especially if it's not been asked for. If us or, or one of the organizations that reaches out has not asked for something. Typically when it's sent, a lot of times it's not not done well. Um, you know, I actually went online and found the top 10 list of, of things you shouldn't send. Ooh, that sounds interesting. And, and number 10 is used clothing. And it's, it's not that used clothing is a bad deal. You just have to be careful about what am I sending? Because, you know, if you don't want to wear it, they don't want to wear it. Um, and then it shouldn't, if, it, if you just throw a bunch of things in a box and you send it and it gets there and nobody's there to accept it, it may sit on the street. It may not be worth anything to anybody. And then if it is, it does go and it's in a mixed box, somebody's got to go through that. So that's volunteer time taken up. So if you're going to send it, one thing would be is find somebody who's going to accept it. If it's in need and they need it, by all means, send it. And then try to organize it before you send it. If it's men's clothes, make it men's clothes certain size. Um, you know, no used underwear, socks. You know, uh, if you're going to send that, you know, make that make sure that's new stuff. But, mm -hmm. um, and it's just one of those things that you got to think about limited volunteer help. It's it definitely bogs the system down if we're if we're having to you know, organize and get that stuff ready before, because we got to do that before we can even give it out. Mm -hmm. You know, that people just, we've seen piles of used clothing sitting on the street and, you know, you'll see a few people going through it, but it's no people, nobody will really go through that stuff. So if you have it organized and you can put it out kind of like, like a boutique type deal, that's one thing. But if it's just piled up, people really don't have time to kind of go through that. So. Okay, so so used clothing is not a good thing. What what else is on uh, on your list? The uh, number nine is used shoes, and it people need shoes. You know, if they've lost everything and they're going to need shoes, but you might just think about one is do they has somebody asked for it, and if they if they have, what are they asking for? Flip flops. You know, a lot of you know after disaster, especially flooding, you don't want to send your your. Um, dress shoes, things like that, because that's not what they need. They just need something they can wear around. So flip-flops may be, may be the idea. And a lot of times they'll, um, uh, disaster responses will ask for certain things and just kind of pay attention to that. And, um, you know, you, we want to help and we have those things and, you know, use clothing and use shoes both. The better idea might be just to have a clothing drive and then sell that stuff and then take that money and then send that. Then, that, then the disaster teams can use that to get exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. um, number eight on the list was blankets. And you, you think about that people need blankets after disaster, and that's true, but a lot of times they're not um, as under uh, need as possible. I mean, there's a lot of times there's 
they've got a lot of blankets on hand. Mm -hmm. um, there again, if it's asked for, by all means, send it. But a lot of times it's, and I, it goes back to that moderation thing. When you get a few things, it's great. But when you get a lot of things, it, it's, it's tough. You know, and, and you, you've, there again, you've got to have people sorting that stuff and working through it. Okay. So, so in a, a situation like this, you keep saying if it's asked for, it's asked for. Does DRT have a way of asking for the things specifically that they need? Website. Uh, you go to our website. Uh, that'll give you an idea. Typically, there's, we have an email uh, system that whenever we are in need of something, we send out an email. I think the, it's about 7,000 emails go out at one time. Okay. So, and we don't like badger people with emails, but if, there, if there's a need or we're, or we're going out on a response, we'll send that email out. But if you go to the website, you can request to get on the, the email list and we'll definitely send out emails as, as we have things going on. Fantastic. That'd be a great thing for people to do right now while there isn't a disaster going sure. on, is hit that email address and, yep. uh, and be, be ready when something happens. Yeah, and the other is Facebook. We use Facebook a lot to, for just quick updates. Mm -hmm. uh, if, there's, if we have pictures of what, what we're doing, a lot of times we'll, we'll post them on Facebook. And so between those two, we get a lot of our communication that way. And Fantastic. The, the, the good thing is, is we can typically communicate that way even if there's no power. You know, we've, as long as we can charge a cell phone, we can typically get communication back and forth. So. Fantastic, fantastic. So the, the, the top 10 things not to send. Number seven, teddy bears. <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny that that pops up there, but it, there again, it's one of those moderation things. You know, you, you see children in need and you want to comfort them. Teddy bear, soft animal, it's one of the things you think, man, that, that would work well. And it would, but just be sure again, if find out, do you need them? Mm -hmm. you know, there was, uh, they, they cited uh, the Newtown, Connecticut shooting, 2012, where uh, that was that school shooting where 20 children were uh, killed and, and six adults. Well, in this, there was an outpouring of teddy bears. With that, they had a 20,000 square foot building that they rented to put, start putting these stuffed animals into. Within a week, that building was full of teddy bears. Wow. And it's just, I mean, that's one of those obvious things that they didn't need that many teddy bears. And uh, you know, what I find interesting is reading that Matt Cole was, a, was the one guy who organized the vigil of that deal. He, he said something that was pretty thought provoking. He said, a teddy bear is wonderful, but a teddy bear can't pay for counseling and a teddy bear can't pay for a funeral. So it, it's one of those things we want to help. Just make sure we're helping in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, number six. Mm -hmm. Medicine. Think, well, we want to help. Never send prescription meds. <laughs> and you'd be amazed at, at times that that stuff comes out. Um, and then if you're doing over-the-counter medications, typically most of those first responder guys who are out there have enough. They have what they need. It, that there again is in the off season when you might go call them up and say, are you in need of you know, over-the-counter medications or this type of thing to help you out, that would be great. But in that situation, that's, that's a bad deal. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of their interesting statements is um, in, in 1988 uh, in Armenia, they had an earthquake and they got 5,000 tons of medications, drugs that were sent in. Wow. And that was, they said that the net worth of that was $55 million. That's $55 million that if they had the cash, they could have done what they needed to. Mm -hmm. But it took 50 people six months to, to categorize and sort that. And, and drugs have an expiration date. Yeah, so half that's probably expired by that time. So, oh. you know, that's just, you know, just think about that stuff and that definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife disagrees with this one. But number five is pet supplies. Mm -hmm. we, we have big hearts. We want to take care of the animals. And, and there again, don't just blanketly send a pallet of dog food or, or cat food mm -hmm. without somebody there to take it. You know, you think, it, I'll get it down there, somebody's gonna take it, but it's amazing how much stuff just kind of gets wasted because there's nobody there to, to distribute that stuff out. So, you know, and there again, reach out to those people who do that kind of stuff. The, the American Humane Society, they, they help out during disasters and you know, they're one of those people you can reach out to to help distribute that kind of stuff. 
Okay. Um, and we we actually do give out some pet supplies as we have it, but a lot of times we're given these big 50 pound bags of dog food. Well, that's kind of hard to maneuver. So, you know, smaller bags, cause they just need to kind of get by till they can get, you know, something else. So might think about smaller stuff. Mm -hmm. Now I kind of already mentioned, but their number four is mixed items. If you just start throwing a bunch of stuff in a box, when it gets there, somebody's got to figure out what to do with all this mixed stuff. So if you can, if you're going to send it, one, if they've asked for it, but send it organized as, as much as you can. If you can, even if you put boxes inside of boxes and then label those boxes as to what they are, that'll help out on the other end, getting that stuff distributed quicker. Okay. This is a good list. Yeah. <laughs> Number three, and this is kind of one of those things, there again, it's moderation, but canned food and bottled water. And it's not that, I mean, we, we give out that stuff. We give mm -hmm. out bottled water, we give out canned foods. And that's great if you send it to somebody who's giving it out. But if you just blanket send something down uh, there again, thinking somebody will, will use this, it may not get to where it needs to go, or you know, it may get wasted before you know. There again, they have expiration dates. Yeah, I, I remember uh, meeting up with your uh, your folks down after uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey, and you know we're there doing a documentary showing the different things the churches mm -hmm. are doing. Right. And uh, truck pulled up. And there was a whole lot of food, not a whole lot of bags. Yeah. So, uh, so the production crew got involved in, in yeah. getting food. Just the logistics of that is, it's a lot of work. Yeah, and that, that's one of those things is, you know, when we start getting stuff in, we typically know when it's coming. When stuff comes unscheduled, you know, we may, even may not have the manpower, because we, we try to send people out to get in the public as much as possible. So we may not have that much staff at the church building. So mm -hmm. if, if we know a truck's coming, we'll try to keep some of those people back to help you know, get that stuff organized. So yeah, it's definitely one of those things is you know, when that truckload comes in and there's three or four people there, it's gonna be a long day, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's great work. Um, number two on their list is unsolicited help. Like I said, we're volunteer based and we love people coming in and working with us and partnering with us and getting in this mission with us. Um, but if you just go down to some place and say, I'm going to go help, many times you'll run into problems because the city officials and the county and the states, they're trying to protect people. So mm -hmm. if you're not with an organization, they may not let you in, especially early on. And then, you know, your impact may not be that great because it's just you. Mm -hmm. um, that's we, when we go in, we get work orders and we have, typically we have 50 people waiting to get help. So if we're waiting on the volunteers and to come in and, and go to work. So you know, with that, we got the work ready to go. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go out there and hunt for the work. You don't have to bring your tools. You don't have to do so many things. We, all we need you is a big heart and ready to go. We'll, we'll take care of everything else. So you know, the biggest thing is if you want to help, you know, come on. But you know, let us know you're coming first. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. And then they, uh, they said that the number one thing is money to the wrong people, which makes sense. You know, make sure if you're going to send a donation, make sure you know who you're sending it to. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, unfortunately, there's a lot of scammers that tend to rise in these situations. So just make sure, you know, if it, especially if somebody reaching out to you to, for you to give help, make sure you know who that is. Mm -hmm. you know, if, uh, if it's somebody you know, like us, or even uh, Nashville, you know who that is. You know, so if if it's that, then go ahead and uh, you know do what you need to do. But just make sure you know where your money's going. And and with you all, uh, if somebody were to call uh, call and talk to the elders, they could uh, get comfortable with the work and and know what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if we're on a response, you can even call that that local church and ask, well, how are you guys doing? Because we, like I said, we work hand in hand with, with the church that's there, and uh, you can get a full understanding of where we're at. Fantastic, fantastic. In the few minutes we have left, as as we think about the, the disaster response team, um, is is that something that people should think about when there's not a disaster, or just when a disaster strikes? Well, it, we love the help when we're when we're there, and, and like I said, in that immediate response, we have a lot of help. Um, but the off season is where we, we try to make headway. 
you know, we're looking at, at making things better. So between those responses, we, we encourage prayer. Um, we, we encourage your thoughts. Volunteering, we, there's things at our headquarters that, I mean, there's, we were up there last week and we were sorting and getting trucks ready to go back out. And so there's things that can be done even between disasters that, that will help us out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me, the, the, you know, the Hurricane Harvey, that was bad in some areas, but wasn't uh, as protracted as uh, of, a, of a period as, as I would have thought. You know, seven months is quite a while there. Uh, is that something that people should always think about the disaster that happened six months ago uh, well, and, and be cognizant of that? Well, and it depends on the, on the disaster. Harvey was big. Um, and we actually went to four different host churches um, at kind of down the, the Gulf Coast there. But big disasters, long time. But you know, I can tell you that most hurricanes, you're going to see about that same kind of response because it takes a while. Mm -hmm. you know, it it in, depends on if it's flooding or if it's wind, but there's a little bit of difference. But if it's a lot of wind and a little bit of rain, then you've got trees and you've got debris. And that stuff can be removed immediately, but a lot of that flooding stuff, um, you know, Houston and Orange and Beaumont, that area took a lot of flooding. We've got to strip the house out, get it down to the bare studs, let it dry before you can even consider going back in and, and rebuilding. So that takes a lot of time. And so with that, we, we do a lot of prep work and then try to work through that kind of stuff. And like I said, we, we're there. If we've got volunteers, we'll stay there as long as we can. First in, last out. Last out. That's a, a great motto. Yeah. And it, it's a great work that you do. And uh, definitely uh, keep you all in our prayers. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to, to be able to sit down and have this conversation when there's not a disaster that's, uh, that's imminent right. and uh, rushing around taking care of things. Uh, but those things do happen. How long does it take you all to, uh, to respond to, uh, to a situation? That there again, it kind of depends on, you know, if it's a hurricane, we're, we're trying to figure out one is where, where it's going to land. And typically we'll call churches along the cone and say, hey, we're available um, and uh, we'll be ready to come as soon as we can get there. Um, like with Harvey, the, I think it made landfall on the 25th of August. Mm -hmm. The 26th of August, uh, there were DRT teams headed, headed to Texas. Fantastic, fantastic. That's uh, that. That's how you get there first. Right. You gotta you gotta be ready to go. John, appreciate you spending the time, and uh, hopefully this has uh, been an encouragement to our uh, our viewers and helps everybody to know what happens during disasters and what you can do to help. Until next time, thanks for watching a preacher and his work.